Hey everyone, Mike here with the Astro Explorers. And I'm here today to talk to you about the use of cameras for taking pictures of the planets. I know I was going to do a video on actually taking the images of the planet, but unfortunately with the night sky the way it is, clouds rolling in and out, that's just not gonna be something that I can do tonight, unfortunately. But I figured now would be a great time to discuss the difference between DSLRs and dedicated astrophotography cameras and how you can upgrade your cameras along the way that makes sense. So pull up a chair if you don't already have one, sit down, relax, and let's go ahead and talk about the differences in these cameras and what might be the best solution for you. All right, so Mike here with the Astro Explorers. And what I wanted to do tonight is go ahead and talk about imaging the planets. Now, imaging the planets is a lot different than imaging the moon or imaging different celestial bodies such as nebula, galaxies, and the like. The reason for that is because when imaging the planets, we do something called lucky imaging. Now, what lucky imaging is, is it is using a camera, typically on a video mode, to take hundreds if not thousands of frames at a time, and then we use software to take portions of those frames, and the software automatically chooses the best parts of those images, and then stitches them together. So what we are looking for when doing lucky imaging is one a good frame rate and then two is clarity of those uh, images that we're getting so most dslrs especially modern dslrs these days do shoot video so that's not an issue if you've got a dslr that's anywhere in the last 10 years of age my canon t2i which is going on 15 years or older at this point, does video. So I can use it to do lucky imaging. Now, the other thing to consider is getting a dedicated astrophotography camera. And when it comes to planetary ones, uh, you can actually get them for a reasonable price. So before we get into the differences between the two cameras, it's important to know that when taking images of planets, it's more taking videos of planets so that you can get the best parts of those frames stitched together in software to come up with your image. All right, so one of the things to take into account when choosing the best camera for lucky imaging and planetary photography is getting the right sensor size. Now, one of the downsides of some of the cheaper planetary cameras is that they have a smaller sensor size than what you might find on a normal DSLR. So if you're already using a DSLR like I am for the videos that I've been doing, switching over to a smaller sensor on a astrophotography camera can add some limitations to that. Now what I'm hoping is I'll have some graphics here showing what the different sensor sizes look like. But imagine if you will, you've got a field of view of what you're hoping to capture in the night. Now, if you've got a larger sensor size, then you should be able to capture that entire field of view. But if you have a smaller sensor size, then you're only able to capture a certain portion of that field of view. So if you're looking at the planets, the way this really starts to impact you is in my experience, when I was using the smaller sensor on the astrophotography camera, if I did not have my telescope aligned just right and I had a little bit of slipping in the movement where the planet just slowly travels across your field of view, if you've got a small sensor size, that planet will only stay inside that field of view for a short amount of time. So you might be sitting there skewing your telescope to keep up with it, or you might have to reset. Where if you have a larger field of view, then you're able to take videos of that planet for a longer period of time. 
So the things that we need to consider when looking at what the best camera is, is our frame rates for capturing planets, because the more frames we get in the least amount of time, the more data the software has to work with. And then two, that larger field of view, if we don't have a great alignment, can allow us to capture that planet for longer. So those are two things to keep in mind when looking at a camera for your planetary photography. All right, so first thing we wanna talk about is your DSLR. So I've got my Canon T2i. Uh, this is the camera that I've been using for astrophotography uh, in these videos so far. It's also the first camera that I had when taking astrophotography other than my cell phones. Uh, so with that, when you're comparing, looking at planets and doing planetary imaging, the, your DSLR can work for it. Now, I don't remember the exact frames per second that this camera can do. Uh, it was between 30 and 60, um, which is fine. It, it's not going to blow anything out of the water, but it does work and it can get the information that you need. But one of the things that you need to look out for when using a DSLR is how are you going to attach it to the telescope? Now, we were using the T-ring to do that earlier with our telescope for taking photos of the moon, uh, or if you wanted to do a deep space object such as the Orion Nebula. But when we get into planetary imaging, we're going to need to use another piece called a Barlow lens. Now, the Barlow lens looks a lot like your normal eyepiece, except you fit this into the telescope eyepiece holder, and then you're able to put an eyepiece into here. And what that does is give you a zoom factor. So with that zoom factor, you're able to see more of the planet because your camera doesn't have different eyepiece lenses to it that you're able to plug in and get different focal ranges or different zoom ratings. <clears throat> so with that, what you do is you use the Barlow and you have to connect your camera to it. Well, unfortunately the Barlow's are made for eyepieces. They're not really made for T-rings. So one of the neat things that you can do, and I'll see if I can find the link and put it in the description, is I actually 3D printed this nose piece that fits onto the Canon, and it will attach to your Barlow lens. So it acts just like your normal camera lens holder. and it will snap into your camera. So now my camera is not going anywhere. And if this is connected to my telescope, I can attach my camera to it, tighten it up. And there we go. It's now attached to your telescope and I'm able to look through with my Barlow lens and my camera. And that gives you kind of that zoom modification, that zoom modification that you'd be looking for when doing planets. Now, of course, when you are using a Barlow, you're shrinking that field of view or you're increasing the size of the planets, which means that if your telescope's not aligned, and you have any drift, that's just gonna make that drift a little bit worse. So that's why it's very important to have those good alignments. And if you don't remember how to do that, there's a link there for you on how to align your telescope. So that is the main points of the DSLR. You need to have a separate nose piece that fits into your Barlow. And, um, for the most part, it's gonna be a little bit limited in what you can do for frames per second. Uh, more modern DSLRs might have a higher range of frames per second, 
but from my experience, it ranges from about 30 to 60 with this Canon T2i. All right, so the next camera we have was my first dedicated astrophotography camera. And this is the ASI, or ZWO, ASI 224MC. And the MC stands for colored. So with this camera, I had two things going for it. Uh, I'll get into the second one later, but the first was I just didn't feel like I was getting enough from the dedicated camera or from the DSLR, not the dedicated camera. But I noticed that the frame rates weren't high enough to capture the amount of data that I felt was needed for planets. Now, I know there are plenty of people that do amazing work with DSLRs, uh, but for the amount of money that the 224 costs, it was well worth the upgrade and the uh, just savings on headaches on uh, being able to get this. One of the big differences though is the sensor size on here. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see the size of that, but it is significantly smaller than what you would get when looking at your just normal DSLR sensor size. So when compared to say the amount of information that's coming from your eyepiece or your connection to your telescope, that sensor size, and again, I'm not sure if that'll come through, does not leave or does not get a lot of that information. So your frame of view is significantly shrunk with this. And then that's also increased by using the Barlow lens. So that Barlow lens increases the magnification, which when you have a smaller sensor makes it a lot harder to find and get in your field of view what it is that you're looking for. Uh, that being said, uh, when I show you how I use it, I'll give some good tips and tricks for it. But typically what I would do is I would center with an eyepiece Focus there, try to have my alignment as best as possible, pull out that eyepiece, and then again, just like the DSLR, this has a nose cone to it as well. Uh, this one though, just simply screws in, and I feel it's a little bit more stable of a structure. And then I would have my Barlow, and I would just simply slide it in, tighten it up, and then this would be connected to my laptop and I would be able to see what it is that the camera was seeing. And then once you have it in view on your laptop, it's generally pretty easy to keep the planets uh, in view as well. So with this, I was probably getting between 180 or 120, 180 frames per second. And one of the reasons for that is the camera itself has a higher uh, refresh rate. And if you, in the software, and I'll show this in the next video, kind of crop the area that you're wanting to shoot, then you're able to actually have a higher refresh of that data being collected by the software. So that comes in real handy if you have a nice steady camera or a nice steady telescope, your alignment's good, everything's staying in the field of view, you can crop that down and you can get a very high frame per second. And then you're just looking to shoot for between 10 and 30 seconds on the max. And that gets you a good amount of data for the processing software to take a look at. But again, this was my first camera, a uh, dedicated astrophotography camera. And I think I really just chose it because it's pretty red, but <laughs> it has really done a great job uh, being a planetary camera for me, other than that sensor size. And if I were to do it again, I would probably go for the larger sensor size model, uh, just to give me a little bit more field of view and uh, make life a little bit easier on that. All right, 
So which camera is going to be the better camera for you for planetary? Well, first answer is always going to be the camera you have. So if you don't have the money to go out and buy a camera, you've already got the DSLR and it can do video, do it. The next video I have is going to show you the process for doing planetary imaging. Um, all you're going to have to do, I'm going to show it with the ZWO, but really the only difference is going to be you plug this one in instead of this one. In my opinion though, having a dedicated astrophotography camera is the right way to go. Um, they're built specifically for what it is we want to do. You get the higher frame rate, you've got better sensors. Uh, they're just built to do astrophotography, so they're going to be better. Now, this one right here, the 224MC, is not a expensive camera. I mean, it's cheaper than a 15-year-old DSLR. Um, so, it is something that, one, if you enjoy doing planetary, you like looking at the planets, getting something like this is a great way to go. And if I were to do it again, I'd honestly probably get the upgraded version with a larger sensor size. I'll look on the internet and see what the name of it is and put it in the description for you. But having a larger sensor size just makes it a little bit easier for finding the planets, especially if you don't want to be swapping between eyepieces and the camera. And then the other reason that I bought this was because I knew I was going to be upgrading through the future. So I wanted to future proof my stuff. And the way I did that was, well, I didn't just get a planetary camera here. I also got a guide scope camera. So I use this camera for my guide telescope as well, which means it's got dual functions. So I was able to use it for planets. And then when I upgraded and got a guide scope, I was able to use this to run my guide scope. And it's a fantastic way if you're just doing small upgrades at a time and you know that you're gonna to wanna to upgrade to get a camera that actually has dual purpose. Uh, the other reason that I like the dedicated astrophotography cameras more is because, and it might not be with all cameras, but I noticed with my DSLR that it would power off on me periodically. And I think that's just one of those things where the old cameras didn't like having to have a power source and just be running all the time so they would power it out. Well, your dedicated camera is always powered because it's powered by USB. So that's not an issue, it's just always running and I'm not losing connection. So with all that being said, I would say if you're looking at upgrading in the future, you know you're gonna be wanting to do guiding, you also wanna do planets, getting a dedicated planetary camera that you can then use for guiding down the road is a excellent way to go. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please go ahead, like and share. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave those comments there. I'm trying to look through those and comment and then there's plenty of other fellow watchers there that might be able to answer your questions as well. Uh, but in the meantime, please keep an eye out for the next video where I will show you how to actually use the dedicated camera, find Saturn, do a recording of it. Uh, that way we can get the data for processing to get your image. And in the meantime, this is Mike with the Astro Explorers calling it a night. Until next time, keep your eyes on the sky and happy stargazing.